billboard, baby, do Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Susan Shand and Anna Mateo. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Susan Shand. Eight years ago, investigative journalist Regina Martinez was found beaten and dead in her home in Veracruz, Mexico. A well-known reporter, she was investigating power and corruption, including the state government's alleged relationship with violent drug organizations. Her death frightened many journalists in Veracruz. It was one of the most brutal murders of Mexican journalists in the past 20 or 30 years, said Jan Albert Hudson. He is the Mexico representative for the Committee to Protect Journalists, CPJ. Martinez's killing is the subject of a new investigation published this month by the Cartel Project. It is the work of a worldwide organization of investigative journalists called Forbidden Stories. Their piece examines the investigation into her death and the mistakes made by the police. It also looks at a social media disinformation campaign about the killing and the reporting Martinez was doing at the time she was killed. She was reporting on thousands of people who had mysteriously disappeared in Veracruz. Forbidden Stories founder Laurent Richard described the organization as a group of reporters who are continuing the work of journalists who have been killed, jailed, or under threat. The larger goal, Richard said, is to say to enemies of the free press that even if you kill the messenger, you will never kill the message. Yet, with the lack of arrests, for journalist killings in Mexico, the continuing violence and the anti-press comments from President André Manuel López Obrador, the future of journalism in the country is bleak, Hudson says. More than 30 journalists were killed directly for their work worldwide in 2020, including at least five in Mexico, the CPJ reports. That number makes Mexico as deadly as Afghanistan, which is the deadliest country in the world for reporters. And those killings almost never end with arrests. López Obrador has agreed that journalism is important, and he has spoken out against the killings. But any attempts to bring arrests have failed, and he is often angry and uncooperative with reporters. The president often criticizes news organizations for providing what he sees as unfavorable coverage. He once told reporters, If you go too far, you know what will happen. López Obrador later said he was talking about a loss of public support. Hudson says Mexican journalists believe the president's language adds to the climate of violence that exists online, including death threats. Journalists also fear the new threat of doxing, 
which is posting personal information about journalists online. This can include their address or other personal information about their families. Government measures have been taken to protect reporters, including a special prosecutor's office to investigate attacks, as well as the use of bodyguards. However, at least six journalists who had the government protections were killed. The lack of effective protection measures is a problem for journalists around the world. They often find they are left to face threats alone. Forbidden Stories is trying to change that. It was founded following several attacks on journalists, including one that received wide news coverage. In January 2015, gunmen killed 12 people and injured several others at the offices of the satirical newspaper Charlie Hebdo in Paris. Richard worked as a journalist in another office on the same floor. This was a very traumatic event for all of us, he said. Richard decided the best way to protect journalists was for them to work together. He started Forbidden Stories in 2017 to connect journalists around the world. It offers protection as well as assistance in investigations. It also shows how the stories of journalists are interconnected. What we wanted to do with the cartel project, Richard said, is to show that when a reporter in Mexico is killed, it's not only a Mexican story. The drug cartels have international political connections. Following leads from Martinez's work, Forbidden Stories, followed the cartel's reach to countries around the world. The final project had five investigative news articles published at the same time by several international news organizations. Hudson believes such journalism efforts are important, especially when investigating things like organized crime or corruption. These are subjects that many Mexican journalists cannot work on without being targeted. I'm Susan Shand. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. As COVID-19 vaccinations begin, health officials around the world are watching for any problems that might develop. These side effects, a result from taking the vaccine, are both expected and unexpected. Recently, two health workers in the state of Alaska experienced allergic reactions after receiving the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. One had a severe reaction and was hospitalized for observation. The second worker's reaction was less severe. Britain recently reported two similar cases. The Associated Press reported that these people had serious allergies in the past. As a result, British officials have warned people with a history of severe allergies to medicines to delay getting the vaccination. Health officials in the United States are not giving such a strong warning. Healthcare workers in the U.S. always ask people about allergies before vaccinations. Instructions for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine say to avoid it if you are severely allergic to one of its ingredients or 
already have had a reaction to it. The U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention advises people to remain under observation for about 15 minutes after a vaccination. Those with a history of allergies should remain for 30 minutes. If they have a reaction, they can be treated immediately. However, doctors said the health worker in Alaska who had the severe allergic reaction had no history of allergies. She experienced redness in her face and difficulty breathing 10 minutes after the first shot. She will not be given a second vaccine shot. The second Alaskan worker experienced less severe signs. Her eyes became puffy, her throat scratchy, and she felt shaky or light-headed. Allergic reactions are common with new medicines. However, observing COVID-19 vaccines for unexpected side effects is more difficult in this case. That is because of the huge number of people who need to be vaccinated over the next year. Another difficulty is the different kinds of vaccines being used at the same time. It is quite possible that one vaccine will have different side effects than another. The first vaccine beginning widespread use in the U.S. and many Western countries is the one made by Pfizer and Germany's BioNTech. The second vaccine from the company Moderna is expected soon. Both vaccines were made using the same method. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration said that huge studies of each have uncovered no major safety risks. Dr. Jesse Goodman of Georgetown University used to be a top vaccine official at the FDA. He told the AP that the allergy concern points out again the importance of real-time safety monitoring. Health officials have several ways of observing how people react to COVID-19 vaccines. The AP said that in coming months, as more people get vaccinated, health officials will create more ways to monitor reactions to the vaccines. Getting either the Pfizer-BioNTech or Moderna vaccine can cause some temporary discomfort. This happens with many vaccines. In addition to pain in the arm, people can experience a high body temperature and other flu-like symptoms. These include extreme tiredness, body pain, feeling cold, and a headache. These symptoms last for about a day, but sometimes they can be severe, causing the person to miss work. Reports suggest these symptoms are more common after the second shot and more common in younger people. COVID-19 vaccines seem to cause more of those reactions than a flu shot. In some people, the reaction is similar to one people get to the vaccine for the infection called shingles. However, some reactions are similar to early coronavirus symptoms. This is one reason hospitals are not giving the vaccine to all their employees at the same time. They are giving the vaccines to workers in smaller groups over a longer period of time. The FDA found no serious side effects in the tens of thousands of people involved in studies of the two vaccines. However, sometimes rare but serious side effects happen when a vaccine is used very widely. 
This also happens when the vaccine did not go through exact and complete tests. The CDC's Dr. Jay Butler warned that balancing any possible risks with the benefits the vaccine provides in the pandemic is an ongoing process. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo. To help protect yourself against the new coronavirus, wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap and water before you eat, after using the toilet, and after touching anything many other people touch, like a seat on a public bus. If you cannot wash your hands with soap and water, use an alcohol-based hand sanitizer that contains at least 60% alcohol. Taking these steps can help prevent not only the new coronavirus disease, but also colds, flu, and other viruses. For more information, visit the following websites. The World Health Organization at www.who.int or the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at www.cdc.gov. And now we present The Making of a Nation. Theodore Roosevelt became President of the United States in 1901. He firmly believed in expanding American power in the world. To do this, he wanted a strong Navy. And he wanted a way for the Navy to sail quickly between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Roosevelt decided to build that waterway. Today, Ashley and I tell the story of the Panama Canal. For many years, people had dreamed of building a canal across Central America to link the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The most likely place was at the thinnest point of land, Panama. Another possible place was to the north, Nicaragua. President Roosevelt appointed a committee to decide which place would be better. Engineers said it would cost less to complete a canal that had been started in the 1880s in Panama. But the United States would have to buy the land and building rights from a French company. The price was high, more than $100 million. So the committee decided it would be less costly overall to build a canal in Nicaragua. The proposal went to the United States Congress for approval. The House of Representatives quickly passed a bill to build the Nicaragua Canal. Then the French company reduced its price for the land and building rights in Panama. It decided some money was better than no money at all. President Roosevelt was pleased. He gave his support to the Panama Plan. When the Senate began debate, however, it appeared the Nicaragua plan would win. Then a volcano exploded in the Caribbean area. A city was destroyed. 30,000 people were killed. Soon, reports said another volcano had become active and was threatening a town. The volcano was in Nicaragua. Nicaragua's president denied there were any active volcanoes in his country. But one of Nicaragua's postal stamps showed a picture of an exploding volcano. That little stamp weakened support for the Nicaragua Canal. 
The Senate passed a bill for a Panama Canal instead. The House of Representatives changed its earlier decision. It approved the Senate bill. At that time, Panama was a state of Colombia. Canal negotiations between America and Colombia did not go smoothly. After nine months, the United States threatened to end the talks and begin negotiations with Nicaragua. The threat worked. In January 1903, Colombia signed a treaty to permit the United States to build the Panama Canal. The treaty gave the United States a canal zone. This was a piece of land ten kilometers wide across Panama. The United States could use the canal zone for one hundred years. In exchange, it would pay Colombia ten million dollars, plus two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. The United States Senate. Passed the treaty within two months. The Colombian Senate rejected it. The Colombian government demanded more money. President Roosevelt was furious. He saw the issue in terms of world politics, not simply Colombia's sovereignty. He said, "I do not think Colombia should be permitted to bar permanently one of the future highways of civilization." Roosevelt was ready to take over Panama to build the canal. That was not necessary. A revolt was being planned in Panama to gain independence from Colombia. The United States made no promises to support the rebels. But it wanted the rebels to succeed. Under an old treaty, Colombia had given the United States the right to prevent interference with travel across Panama. Now the United States used the old treaty to prevent interference from Colombian troops. Several American warships were sent to Panama. The local leader of the Panamanian revolt was Manuel Amador. Amador had the support of the French company that still owned the rights to build the Panama Canal. The chief representative of the company was Philippe Bunau Varia. He worked closely with an American lawyer, William Cromwell. Bunau Varia and Cromwell provided Manuel Amador with a declaration of independence, a constitution, and money. Amador used the money to buy the support of the Colombian military commander in Panama City, the capital. He also got the support of the governor, who agreed to let himself be arrested. On the day of the revolt, Amador formed a small army of railroad workers and firefighters. The rebel army planned to take over Panama City on November fourth, nineteen o three. Just before that, five hundred Colombian soldiers landed at Colon, eighty kilometers away. The soldiers could not get to Panama City. However, all but one railroad car had been moved to the capital. Manuel Amador gave a signal. The revolution began. There was a little shooting, but no one was hurt. Most of the shots were fired into the air to celebrate the call for Panama's independence. Colombian officials were arrested quickly. Then Amador made a speech. He said, "Yesterday we were slaves of Colombia. Today we are free. President Theodore Roosevelt 
has kept his word. Long live the Republic of Panama. Long live President Roosevelt. Colombia asked the United States to help it regain control of Panama. The United States refused. It said it would oppose any attempt by Colombia to send more forces there. The United States also recognized Panama's independence. And almost immediately, it started negotiations with the new government on a canal treaty. The two sides reached agreement quickly. The treaty was almost the same as the one the Colombian Senate had rejected earlier. This time, however, the canal zone would be 16 kilometers wide instead of 10, and the United States would get permanent control of the canal zone. The treaty was signed on November 18, 1903. That was just 15 days after Panama declared its independence. Colombia protested. It said the United States had acted illegally in Panama. Many American citizens protested too. They called President Roosevelt a pirate. They said he had acted shamefully. Some members of Congress questioned the administration's deal with the French Canal Company in Panama. Several investigations examined the deal. Theodore Roosevelt did not care. He was proud of his success in getting the canal started. He said, I took the canal zone and let Congress debate. And while the debate goes on, so does work on the canal. It took 10 years for the United States to complete the Panama Canal. The first ship passed through it in August 1914. In that same year, the United States signed an agreement with Colombia. The agreement expressed America's regret for its part in the Panamanian Revolution, and it provided a payment of $25 million to Colombia. Theodore Roosevelt was no longer president when the agreement was signed, but he still had many friends in the Senate. He got them to reject it. After Roosevelt's death, the United States signed another agreement with Colombia. The new agreement included the payment of $25 million. It did not include the statement of regret. The Senate approved the new agreement. The issue of America's involvement in Panama caused much bitterness in other countries of Latin America. Some did not feel safe from American interference. President Roosevelt said the United States would not interfere with any nation that kept order and paid what it owed. Roosevelt was worried because some Latin American countries were having difficulty repaying loans from European banks. He did not want the issue of non-payment used as an excuse for European countries to seize new territory in the Western Hemisphere. Roosevelt said the United States was responsible for making sure the debts were paid. His policy led to further United States involvement in Latin America. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.